how did you become interested in intuitionist mathematics? Well, it's actually a long story because so I, I'm interested in uh, probabilities and uh, I keep, of course, understanding nature and physics uh, since uh, since almost ever. Uh, and I always thought it's a bit strange this idea that you know if you that that things that physics is deterministic. You know, start with classical physics; that's the way. You start learning it at high school and in universities, and there everything is deterministic. And uh, it, it was a bit bizarre, but okay, I accepted that and so on. But then uh, more recently, as I realized that actually, in a, especially in a chaotic system, and most classical dynamical systems are chaotic, uh, the determinism is actually not only a consequence of the equations, but also of the assumption that the initial condition is really perfectly determined. It's a real number, the standard real number. So you have a, an integer, you have a dot, and then you have an endless series of digits. And if you remove this assumption that the initial conditions are perfectly determined, but there would be some indeterminacy, then uh, automatically, Classical mechanics would also become indeterministic, was quantum is, uh, at least in the case of chaotic systems. So that was one thing. And then when I was actually presenting that somewhere in uh, Jerusalem, in this case, uh, some uh, professor there, Carl Posse, told me that actually what I'm doing with these uh, kind of not really real numbers. Uh, is intuitionistic mathematics. I've never heard of that before, but uh, he was actually, he was by coincidence just writing a book on it, a kind of simple little book, uh, I don't know, 150 pages maybe. And um, I, okay, he started explaining me a bit the basics of this intuitionistic mathematics, and I found it extremely appealing and, uh, and intriguing. First, it's a branch of mathematics. It's not a very well known. It's not the main uh, mathematics uh, researcher for most uh, most mathematicians, but it exists, and it exists actually since hundred years, so more than hundred years now. And uh, if instead of using the standard mathematics, we just switch to these other mathematics, in which you also have theorems, you also have calculus, you also have okay, continue. You have all that, but in this other branch of mathematics, um, if you use that one to, to do classical mechanics, then this uh, conclusion that, uh, that that nature should be deterministic, or at least that classical mechanics or theory provides a deterministic description of nature, goes away. Classical mechanics becomes indeterministic. And so I found that really very fascinating. And there's maybe just one more thing before I finish with this first question. In this uh, math, uh, intuitionistic mathematics, there's one thing which is uh, really astonishing. It's namely the idea that, you know, as time passes, you gain more and more information. So it's not that all the digits are there once forever and since ever. The digits really come, become determined, get that right, become determined as time passes. And so you also have here a branch of mathematics. Again, it's a very respectable branch of mathematics, or sub-branch of constructivist mathematics, in which time enters. And uh, you know, in physics, we have a, a problem with time. Time in physics, whether now it is quantum or classical or relativity, is just an evolution parameter. It's a parameter we denote it with a T, and we see T R represents time. But the time that we experience, we the humans, certainly also the animals, is not that. It's not just an evolution parameter that just tells you what kind of tra where along a fixed uh, trajectory trajectory you are. Really, things happen in life, and uh, and they happen as time passes. And so this intuitive understanding of time that we all have, all humans, all animals, and that uh, is 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 is, missed, is not existing in physics. 
Einstein, many people were a bit uh, worried about that. Most physicists just accept it at the end. Again, see, because it's all deterministic, so it's all there since ever, forever, like this, real numbers. But again, if you go to this intuitionistic mathematics, in the mathematics already, in the language, in the very basic language that we, the physicists, use to talk about physics, talk about nature, and so on, there is time. And I think that is that might be a very uh, interesting way of uh, reconsidering the problem of formulating physics, including some concept of time, or when I often call it creative time, a time in which something happens. It's not just like in a movie where everything is only there, you just you know go along the movie, but you don't create anything. Uh, I think in life we are creative uh, by nature, and uh, so uh, we need some creative time in our best uh, physics theory, which we don't have yet. It, it's, it's interesting that the choice of language, the choice of mathematics is what determines the ontology here. Yeah. Yeah, I think this, this is up and very fascinating indeed. This came as a surprise to myself. I, I didn't expect that. You know, I studied mathematics, have a bachelor in mathematics, I hitched to my physics degree. Mathematics has never been a problem for me. And I thought, yeah, that's the obvious thing. And uh, yeah, and, and now, yeah, <laughs> in the last years, I, I realized that the, the language indeed affects uh, the worldview that that uh, physics provides us. I mean, I, I don't know. So I speak English or French and German and a few languages, and so everybody who, who speaks more than one language knows that there are concepts that are easier, ideas that are easier to express in one language with respect to another language. And I will, but I thought always, oh, this is really for natural uh, languages, human languages. And I thought, yeah, in mathematics, very precise. Cannot be uh, just like that. And in mathematics, that would not be the case. But actually, you have different mathematical languages. And these different mathematical languages also leads to different uh, yeah, worldviews than when physics pre presents you. So physics is not only a set of uh, you know, experimental results and data and all that. Actually, the language you use to sort out all your data, so you formulate a theory with some ontology, that you get some explanations. But then, if you write it down in one or another mathematical language, the, con the, the, the conclusion or the, yeah, the, the, the worldview again changes completely, and it can go from deterministic to indeterministic, which is kind of the opposite. So to, to dive down into sort of the details of intuitionist mathematics, uh, so, the, so the main differences between Classical mathematics and intuitionist mathematics are that in classical mathematics, the real numbers are sort of just stipulated. All the information about them are are there from the beginning. Yeah, and remember, so a, re a typical real number has an infinite number of digits, and these digits are actually random. If they would be very structured, if it's one third, you know, it's zero dot three 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 three. Okay, there's a lot of structure, and these you can of course compress. You can just write one divided by three. So uh, for, for these kind of numbers, you can compress everything. That the one that can be compressed, we call them computable. But most of the, the real numbers cannot be compressed. So there is no structure in the in the series of digits. And because there is no structure, if you want, if I want to give you a real number, I have to give you an infinite amount of information. That is going to take forever. First of all. And uh, whatever the bandwidth of our communication is, it's going to take forever. So you really have to understand that when we say, let x0 be the initial condition, physicists say that all the time, actually we are making an enormous uh, assumption here. We say, let x0 denote the infinite amount of information, which then would allow one to, at least in principle, compute all the future of the dynamical system. But I have to give you initially an infinite amount of information, not just that a little bit. It's infinite, at least for chaotic systems. If it is not chaotic, you don't need that much. But for chaotic systems, I need to give you infinite information. And um, 
you know, knowing figure about it, not from a mathematical point of view, but from a physics point of view, there are no infinities. Each time it's finite, it's great and everything at once, but yeah, there are no infinities. And for instance, if I just consider that it's this little volume here, and imagine I have a little marble here in the middle, the initial condition, let's say the center of mass of this marble in this finite volume should be inscribed according to standard views by a real number. So there should be an infinite amount of information in my little volume. And again, from a physics point of view, you never have infinite densities of information. And as, as soon as you realize that and you say, okay, let's now say that my, my, my numbers have finite information, it's a finite information, maybe this information may be growing as time passes, but at each time it is finite. Uh, then you see that you have actually some indeterminacy. So my marble as much, my marble's center of mass doesn't have a, a perfectly determined uh, position. There is some indeterminacy here. And okay, now if my bubble is just staying there or if it's just oscillating like a pendulum, that's okay. But if it's evolving with some chaotic dynamical system, then this, this very, very small initial indeterminacy may kind of you know, drive the system, bubble in this case, one way or the other. So it may evolve completely differently. This is now the indeterminacy. So indeterminacy in a chaotic system leads to indeterminacy. It may go one way or it may go another way. Right. And the way that uh, Platonist mathematics solves this is that it stipulates both infinite information and instantaneous access to all that information. Yeah, you, you have well, access, I don't know whose access, but for sure it is there since ever and forever. So again, let x0 be a real number as an initial condition. There, you, you give everything, that X0, infinite information, bang, at once. And uh, so I said that's it in my lectures for, of course, for, for years. But now I realize that this is a bit absurd. It's, a, it's an excessive assumption. Just, just as a quick aside, when I talk to a lot of mathematicians, they say that Platonism is kind of the intuitive way that they think about mathematics when they're not really thinking about the high-level theory. They're just doing the math. Um, yourself as, as a mathematician, as someone who thinks about intuition as mathematics, do you share that commitment or are you finding it more natural to do math with an intuitionist view in the background? Yes. So indeed that, that mathematicians, many of them, I need have these platonistic views of these numbers and these mathematical objects. They exist in some yeah, platonistic world and this platonistic world exists. No, it's outside of space and time. There's no time there. So it's a timeless language, mathematics, and and maybe it's very okay. Maybe for sure it is very beautiful. It's very attractive intellectually. Mathematics is is beautiful, and mathematicians should continue developing this uh, this super elegant uh, uh, almost poetry. Uh, but that's one thing. That's mathematics, and there's nothing wrong with doing that. But when I now want to apply that to physics, I would like to, I would have a language in which time enters. And I want a language in which yeah, things can evolve and there can be some creativity. I think that exists in, uh, in nature and I want to be describing nature. So I better have a language that allows me to describe nature as it is and not uh, as if would be, if it would be, I don't know, in a, in a, in a paternistic world. And so uh, I think for physicists, uh, intuition is, is much more natural. Right. And it doesn't make sort of extra metaphysical assumptions about the ontology of mathematics. And they exist different mathematics. And in, in, the, in the classical mathematics, that's the platonistic view, and these objects exist yeah, outside of space-time, have nothing to do with space and time. It doesn't depend on time. They are always the same since ever, forever behind the same relationship and so on. But in intuitionistic mathematics, this other type of uh, mathematical language, objects, including mathematical objects, including numbers, can evolve in time. So things change, new information gets created as time passes. 
And uh, this is certainly very surprising. I probably most uh, physicians, uh, mathematicians, even more, would uh, would have a hard time uh, swallowing what I'm saying. Um, but it's again, it's it's a, it's a language which is well uh, developed, formulated, which I mean, you can do all the computation. Actually, everything you can do on a computer, you can do there. Maybe a computer is a good example. Uh, so I'm not saying that intuition is reduces to a computer. Actually, intuition is was invented before computers. But when you have something going on in your computer, for instance, you want to simulate the climate. Climate is something important. It's very uh, timely. Uh, how do people simulate climate? They have huge computers, but finite. And then they put the best initial condition they can put into their simulation. So, they, but they cannot put a real number as initial condition because a real number is infinite transformation, and they have a finite computer. So they truncate. So we take truncated initial conditions, and then they run the algorithm, the simulation algorithm, maybe a deterministic uh, algorithm. But because it is chaotic, the weather, the climate are chaotic dynamic systems. So when we go on a run of their simulation, at some point. This truncated initial condition is no longer sufficient. We need additional information. How do we do that? We just put random digits into it. And first you may say, but that's, that's, that's nonsense. It's not random. But yes, it is random because anyway, you know, if you go to the to very, very small scale of one H, the air molecules around, the last, the fine digits, they are clearly irrelevant. So you can't put whatever number there. And so it, it, in practice, the, the guys who are really doing that, really, in a, you know, professionally, a climate uh, uh, physicist, they add uh, to this initial truncated condition, they add random digits. And that's the way then they, they let the, the simulation evolve over tens of years, a hundred years, and predict, uh, you know, if we don't, if we don't pay attention, then the climate will uh, heat up more and more, and so on. So the, the real physicists are doing that. Of course, we don't do we're not conscious that we are somehow doing intuitionistic mathematics, but that's what we are doing. It does work. We don't use real numbers with infinite information. It doesn't fit in the computer anyway. And as time passes, as the simulation propagates, so it was we add additional information. How do you view the continuum in, in intuitionist mathematics? Yeah, that's a very, very good question. So the continuum is also an unknown about the continuum in the intuitionistic mathematics. So if you take the numbers between zero and one, uh, they are in the infinitely many, uh, okay, we call it choice sequences in, in, in the intuitionistic uh, Mathematics, let's call it just intuitionistic numbers, not to introduce too many terminology. Let's just call it intuitionistic numbers. So these numbers evolve and you, you will, they all will evolve um, in such a way that they are going to cover the entire continuum. So it will not remain any holes or anything like that. It's, and this continuum, if you go now to the limits of infinite time, I don't want to go to infinite time because I don't want infinities. But if you think in terms of going to these infinite times, then you really just recover the standard real numbers. Because then, because at the end of time, everything is settled. Of course, there's nothing like the end of time. But don't do infinity. But if you want to understand that, maybe a bit intuitively, at the end of time, indeed, all the digits are there. So you recover real numbers. But at any finite time, even then, you know, a thousand years or whatever, there will only be a finite amount of information. But additional information is popping up continuously. As the process evolves. Yes. Yes, as the process evolves.